Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 237. I'm your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com, and we're excited to have with us the internationally acclaimed and award-winning writer of speculative fiction, novels, and short stories, Morgan Quaid. Hey, welcome. Hey. Hello, I mean, hey. not welcome. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I felt like I was, I was for some reason, welcoming you. You to my show, but that's not the way to get <laughs> up. Anyway, you do, and welcome. so, and you do have you are award winning. I saw that you did recently get you were awarded the the horror fiction for the N was it the NN Light Book Award? Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, that was that that was a surprising one. So that was for the third book in the uh, Seven Hungers. Uh, I was going to say trilogy, but there's five books so far, so. <laughs> series we'll call it um yeah so that was a really really nice surprise before we kind of jump into it morgan too is like i guess the, the first question is how do you have the time to do all of this stuff uh i have a uh i have a fair bit of time but i, I have a very very disciplined uh writing rhythm and a mm -hmm. very very unsettled mind so, so the combination of those two things, and I'm an incredibly good starter. I, I can start 50 projects a day and I'm right. so energized when I'm starting something that if it's a small enough thing, I could get, get it done incredibly quickly and then uh, it's finished and I'm on to the next thing. So I kind of try and use that to my advantage. Um, but I, I do also, um, I have a trick to how I force myself to keep being productive and keep producing and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so no matter what happens every single day, uh, two or three projects are progressing in, in some ways. Um, yeah. Right. And, when, and talk about that, cause you also, you have a really, so for those that are listening, listening to the podcast on the audio version, I'll put the link in the show notes. Morgan also has a really good YouTube channel that where you talk about, you give some writing tips and you give some really good writing advice. They're in bite-sized formats, because usually if you want to find a writing advice, you have to watch a 30-minute video. These are set yeah. up into like less than 10 minutes, which are really helpful. And you talk about, for those that are wanting to be comic book creators, comic book authors, mm. but you also talk about novel writing on, on some tips to do that too. Now, how did you kind of get the idea to kind of tweak your YouTube channel to actually have some of those on there as well? Well, that that's only a recent thing. So I, I, it was over the Christmas break, and just before that break, I was thinking through because I've had a, a podcast that I've been running for a few months, uh, just interviewing, mm -hmm. you know, like this interviewing creative people and all that sort of stuff. Co you know, my day job career, I've I've done uh, training and run training teams for a long, long, long time. So for mm -hmm. some reason, it just all came to to a head at, at a moment in time, and I thought, well, uh, uh, the, you know, there's so much that I've learned and so many mistakes that I've made. <laughs> And it's it's quite hard when you're a new indie writer, whether that's comics or, or novels or whatever, it's quite hard to get a lot of this information still. As you say, you have to watch an incredibly long, you know, video or you have to, you know, read a lot of blog posts and stuff. So I thought, well, there's a real need for something short, sharp, entertaining. Uh, it also, uh, you know, meets my need to just have silly do stupid stuff and silly humor and all that sort of stuff, which I can add in there. Um, so it's tremendous fun for me to do as well. But it, it's also, yeah, it's it's more or less built for new writers or or early career writers that are wanting to know how do I do this? What does it cost? How do I get myself out there? What are the pitfalls to look out for? Uh, and it's effectively a laundry list of uh, all the mis mistakes that I've made and what I've learned and, <laughs> you know, trying new things and all of that sort of stuff. And, yeah, and, and since I've started, it's it's only been the last month that I've really pivoted, to use uh, the word for the moment, uh, into that. And it's been incredibly enjoyable. And even just to be... Because one of the problems we have as indie writers, I think, is connecting with other creatives and writers and all that sort of stuff. The, the comic right. community, I think, is pretty good at doing that. Um, the novel writing community is is good in pockets, but not as good, I don't think. So just having something like this and starting to connect with new writers and everything has been just incredibly rewarding. Um, and it's it's helped me think a bit more about my own processes and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, but also just lots of fun. Lots of work, but lots of fun. Well then, so I'm I'm really curious too because when I, I'm watching watching some of these videos, it's the uh, the professionalism of the quality of that is 
pretty high as well. What do you use for your graphics? How do you use that? What's your editing software? I'm very curious about that as well. Well, first of all, thank you, because, you know, you're always a bigger critic of your own work than anyone else. So I look at all of these and just see all the mistakes and think, oh, man, you know, anyway. Um, so I I have uh, I have a few things. So I have an old, um, it's old now. It's, a uh, I think, a D5 or something like that, Canon digital camera. So it's it's not not one of the newer ones, but it's an older mm -hmm. one, but it does the trick. Um, uh, I have also the benefit of, because I've been working so long now in comics, and I do my own lettering. And I did for a period have a, a very skilled graphic designer living upstairs in our house. So while he was here, this is a decade ago now, I was just getting everything out of his head about how do you use Photoshop? What you, Show me how to make the magical things happen. So yeah. I've known and, and used that for a long time now. So putting the images together, um, that's something I, I quite enjoy. And it's a big part of you know running a channel and all that sort of stuff. The video editing is fairly new. That's only been the last few years that I've started to get into that, that they have available now. So I use Filmora uh, and I'm at the moment and I'm toying up whether to go with uh, DaVinci Resolve uh, or which direction I'm going to go in. But I will ultimately go for whatever is quickest and easiest but still gets the top quality. Because these things, like an eight-minute video will take, uh, you know, maybe 20 minutes to an hour to write the script, you know, 20 minutes to shoot five or six hours to edit so the <laughs> the time in which you would you would understand that the time involved and the effort involved is extreme particularly at the, at the early end when you're just learning this sort of stuff so anything that can make that job easier is what i will go for um and the, like i said there are tools around that make it so much you can literally just drop and drag whereas previously uh when i'd done video stuff it was you know 10 12 13 years ago lot harder you needed a very high spec machine to do things and all the rest of it um so yeah that but it's it's pretty standard tools most of the adobe suite i use and it's primarily photoshop um as i said filmora uh at the moment and then also camera like the the cameras that we have these days everyone says it but they are amazing quality at what they can do so my second camera is just my phone and i'll oh, wow. you know in, intersplice you know uh, stuff like that. Oh, there's my cat. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, So, but you're also a musician as well. Like the, the background mm. music, is that something that, um, uh, that, that you purchased or is that music that you did yourself? It's both. So this is an interesting one uh, because again, okay. for me, the, it's a balance between speed and effort and, and quality, um, trying to align those, those three things. Um, and speed is is a really big factor because it's also my my interest will wane as as the thing goes on. So if I can get quicker, I'll keep the le high level of interest the whole way through and then get through it in, in one one go, particularly for a five hour edit or something like that. Um, so the music I do, uh, uh, so I run a uh, and have for uh, oh almost a decade now a, a um a music loop label or a series of labels. There's a few that I actually run. And it's essentially, I initially, me as a musician, I will put small pieces of music together and then I sell them in packs for other music producers to use in their own productions and all that sort of stuff, you know, royalty-free sort of stuff. Um, right. So I do that, have done that for years, and I write music for film and TV, and then that some of that gets used and all the rest of it. It's a very long, long game, and there's not a huge amount of money in it. But for me, there's enough to fund the initial comic stuff that I started doing and, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, so I've done that for ages. So I've got a, a back catalog of music. Um, I've got somewhere in the vicinity of three to 4,000 songs, most of which I can't use because they're copyright protected, even though they're mine, <laughs> because they're being sold exclusively through another provider. So, that, so I'm limited with my own stuff that I can use. So some of it I will use myself or I'll just um, make. And I'll, I've got a few songs that I've just made that I repeat. But others I just find free on the internet and use it and just make sure the terms are okay. Um, right. But occasionally I'll, I'll, I work with a lot of indie um, uh, musicians as well. And so I will get them to put a specific thing together that I'm, I'll use for multiple things, but I'll also just chop it up and use for the, the thing as well. It's that whole thing about, and again, it's, it's, I'm getting realizations every day because I, you know, I put my first three videos out there and I put a few videos out there about comics. And then I realized, Morgan, you haven't put any of the comic art that you've got 
in this thing. Like it's the most exciting thing about the whole process. You've got tons of it that you own and you can do whatever you like with and you haven't put it. What are you doing? And then right. so I started putting that in there. Then I started to realize you've got all this music. What, what, you're not even using it. So I started putting, because I realized, you know, creatives like to listen to music often when they're doing, whether they're drawing or writing or whatever. So I've just started putting some albums out uh, on YouTube with the music and the artwork and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, right. Yeah, those, those down there. But it just didn't dawn on me, hang on, you should leverage off the things that you've already got and that you you already do. Because um, right. some of those things are unique to you. You know, other other creators won't have that. So, yeah, I'm still learning all of that and weaving in everything that I can. And occasionally I'll have a video that will have one of my, you know, tracks in there and, you know, those sorts of things as well. I mean, because you're, you're a good example of the fact that you're, you're an artist and a writer and a creative that does a lot of things. Uh, how do you make the decision when you're, as you say, you, like you could conceivably start like 50 projects a day. How do you make the decision on I want to do this? because there's a monetary value to it, or I want to do this because I want to make this. How do you make those decisions? Oh, so honestly, the, the, the monetary side of things hasn't really come into it until very, very recently because I, mm -hmm. I so a, a lot of what I do is particularly on the comic side, I run Kickstarter campaigns, uh, you know, crowdfunding campaigns to effectively fund the, the book um i've already built the book paid the artists done all of that so there's no risk that the project won't go ahead but there is a big risk that i won't get enough money <laughs> to, to cover right. the costs what i found though is um from project to project a you can't count on getting the same number of backers and the same amount of money b right. you don't and this is a really interesting thing as a as an uh an artist and a creator you don't know what people are going to really love versus what they're going to not like so much. You do. So right. because I'm excited about something doesn't necessarily mean the vast, you know, group of people are as well. And a lot of it's down to reach and all that sort of stuff. So Shadow's Daughter is, is an example of one where I thought what I want to do is give for this one, give people value and see, see what that does to the whole enterprise. So that had six, six books in one. Wow. Uh, six new books that no one had seen. And the way I could do that was some of them were black and white, so they were cheaper to produce. Um, so it was two color books. They were oversized, like, that, you know, 60 pages each, and then six side issues revolving around the same story but black and white. And that was a very practical reason because I knew if I do them in color, I'm never going to make any money, but if I do them the other way. And then, of course, you leverage off a previous project you've done by selling the digital versions of those along with this you know, the print versions of this. And you, so it, it kind of, you, you get a catalog together and then you slowly grow from there. But I'm I, uh, the problem is I haven't had enough out there for long enough and had enough traffic coming through because um, I do it uh, myself. I also work with um, mid to, to in, you know, indie publishers as well. So it takes a long time for you to get to the point where you think, ah, okay, I know that this thing works. If I do this, I know it's going to make X amount. I'm, I'm still at the stage where I know I can successfully fund a campaign and I know I can get, you know, a certain number of backers, you know, f fairly regularly, but mm. I don't know really how much money it's actually going to equate to. I don't know when they're going to come in. I don't know how much work I'm going to have to do to really push people to it. Um, right. and each, each one is its own thing, which, which makes it hard as a business. It's very different to the music side of things where after a while you get to know, all right, here's the ceiling. Here's what I need to be doing each month to be getting to that point and maintaining it. It's a little bit more stable in the way that that's run. Um, right. and the novel side honestly is, I mean, talk about a, a, a slow burn and, a, you know, because the other thing is. Okay, so the, the downside with the comics is if unless you're the artist, you're paying for an artist and that is hugely expensive. So we're talking thousands of dollars per issue, which puts you behind the eight ball from the start, you know, when you're immediately starting. So you've got to recoup that before you even start at ground zero, whereas at least with a novel, it's the time investment. Um, you might pay someone to put together a cover um, or you could do it yourself, but then the cost is on promoting and giving it running giveaways and doing all of that sort of stuff, which is still a cost. Uh, but you, you're not starting, you know, further back than zero, you're just starting at zero. Um, but I, I find as well, you know, 
I haven't run a Kickstarter with novels yet because I've got too many other projects <laughs> to fit in. Um, but that's an interesting one where I'm wondering, you know, would I get the same pickup for, you know, novels as I do with the the artwork and all that sort of stuff. But it's a, it's always a consideration. But I suppose at this point, in my, my mind is split between sort of two areas. The music side is all... I need this to fund what I'm doing. So this is money. Mm. And this is, I mean, I still love it. I still enjoy it, but it is a, it is a business that I run to bring in money so that I can experiment and do crazy, stupid things with the other side and not worry too much that, you know, I'm, I'm going to blow through my life savings and not have any money. anyway. Right. So it's one funds the other. And that's pretty much, you know, I'm only just turning the corner now where I'm uh, okay. Now I need that to start funding itself now and, it, you right. know, and making money. Yeah. So where do you, f- where do you find your artists for your comics? Uh, well, so when I when I first started, I made the cardinal. Okay, I'm not even going to say the cardinal error because I made many, many, many mistakes. Uh, my <laughs> first, uh, my first Kickstarter, I because I'm in Australia, so <clears throat> ran the Kickstarter, uh, printed the books in the US, had them pre- posted back to Australia and then predominantly posted them back again to the U S because that's where most of the backers were. Um, mistake number one, ladies and gentlemen, don't, don't double your postage or triple your postage. That's, that's not a good way to do it. Um, so my mistake was I just went in and started doing it. As soon as I discovered the whole indie comic scene, I thought I had a, a backlog of novels ready to go. And I thought I could turn these into, into comic books. That would be amazing. It's like one right. step away from film uh, visuals and everything. So I just started, did not reach out to anyone, didn't bother to find out, hey, is there a comic scene in Australia with people that I could talk to? Turns out there is. Turns out there's a really big active scene. Um, there's a group, uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch, but there's a group called uh, Comics, a um, guy named um, Shane Siddle, Sizzle, and a bunch of amazing artists that now I know and have relationships with and can lean on for projects and those sorts of things. When I first started, though, there's a little bit of fear when you're first starting and you're thinking, there's fear and are they going to cost more and take too long? So yeah. I started going through Fiverr and Upwork and those sorts of places and and basically auditioned artists. So uh, I, I want you to give me two pages of this comic. Here's the script. Here's the basic idea of the characters. Um, and I would pick two or three, which is, again, an outlay of money, but the risk is you don't want to sign someone if, you know, so part of the process is you want to see their art quality. You want to see can they deliver in time. If they If they're doing two pages... And they don't deliver that on time already. That's telling you for a bigger project, this ain't going to happen. So I learned through that and I'd I'd sort of done the same thing with music. So it was just carrying that same process over with, with different sort of contractors. Um, And through that, I ended up finding two or three really solid artists. So one of those is uh, Willie Roberts. I work with Willie a lot on a lot of projects Um, and he's a good mate now. And, and he's, he always delivers the goods. He's always on time. Uh, he's flexible. He supports on social media. It's all the good things that you want in the perfect artist and that that relationship. Um, but that's grown over, you know, five or six years of working together on certain th- to the point where he's he's got his own pet project that he's now getting me to help write while he's doing the artwork. Um, it's like a horror, uh, post-apocalyptic horror thing called Hounds, and the, uh, the artwork is amazing. Um, but anyway, uh, so... It started off just by reaching out. And I, I would say over the years, I've worked with probably 30 to 40 artists just on the comic side. Um, and of those, there were five or six that I would say uh, dependable, amazing quality work, um, you know, always deliver in, within time frames and all that, that sort of stuff. So right. it, it is a risk, but there are, I mean, there, there's some that, uh, I was hoping to get the project done in uh, two months and they've taken two years there, are, you know, uh, it, and, and, and the money's gone. So I've spent the money to, to get to that point right. or half the money or whatever, which is a risk that you, you have with this sort of thing. Um, but so my advice to new people would be f- reach out to people, you know, locally or find people locally first, go into a comic book shop and say, Hey, do you know any indie creators I can talk to? And then just start right. that way. Um, subscribe to my channel and uh, watch all the awesome advice and such. And, you know, that's another good step. But, yeah, definitely reach out and start talking to people because there's so much knowledge out there. And if you don't uh, take advantage of it, you, you're going to – it's going to cost you money and time and effort and all those sorts of things for sure. 
There you go. You do have one too. So, you know, like I say, you check, definitely go to that youtube.com backslash at Morgan the Quaid. You do have a good video that talks about that, finding the best artist for your comic. When you find a good artist, mm -hmm. there's almost the point where they also represent the voice on your comics. How territorial would you be as a writer to recommend someone like a really good artist that really you feel, do you want to, like, oh, can yeah. Is there a point like, is it like, hey, can I share that? Or like, how does that work as as a, as a comic creator? Like, how, how does the relationship work with other writers? It's a, it's a very, very real thing. So there's, there's probably two aspects to that. So the first aspect is uh, almost all indie artists are on a curve, an up, an up curve, because they get better the more they do. And then right. they get higher demand and then potentially a, a bigger studio sort of leans over and goes, hey, we want you to do this or that they apply and they get something. So their prices go up as well. So you use them for a project and then a few years later, another project. And then all of a sudden they, they come to you and say, look, I'm sorry, but I'm going to charge more now because my artwork's gone up, which is all fair enough. But it means right. that for most indie artists, you've got them for a period of time. You can only keep them for two or three years max and then they're gone because either the cost is prohibitive <laughs> or they've moved on and they're no longer available. Um, I've got three unfinished comics because artists have disappeared or gone on to other things and they're too busy and they've been sitting there for years and I'm hoping that they'll be available again, but it just doesn't happen necessarily. I, I did have an idea at some point to put together a Kickstarter campaign of all of the unfinished artwork and the trials that I started with that didn't go, almost like just a sketchbook of all of these ideas that never went anywhere because of one reason or another. But We'll see right. if that that happens. Um, so that's the first thing is there's that that curve. The other thing is, so again, coming from the the music industry and you know dealing with indie artists all the time, I, I was a, a pseudo hip hop producer for a while as well, which meant dealing with a lot of young rappers and those sorts of things. Man, that was a whole whole education. <laughs> uh, that that side of things. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, please come to this middle aged uh, bald white man from Australia, and I will learn you about hip hop. Um, <laughs> It, that was really interesting though. It taught me a lot about, because the, the young uh, hip hop artists, they have no shame and they will promote and push themselves and they will, but what they don't have, a lot of them is they don't have the nows about business. They don't have customer service and they don't realize that every person you're connecting with is a potential fan. So do the right thing by them. The ones that do tend to, I think, go further. Great. So on any creator community for, for comics, um, yeah, you can get a reputation for just burning other creators by stealing their um, artists. So, for example, there's a, a fantastic artist, uh, David Luhan, uh, and I've added a Khan there, which I don't think is there. Apologies, David, if you see this. Um, still don't know how to pronounce his surname. So he's he's just done uh, uh, the art. He's just finishing off the artwork for a new comic that I shouldn't have done. This is one of those ones that it was a great idea, and I thought, ah, oh, I'll just do something small. And it'll just be really quick and easy. And I'll just get someone to do really crappy little artwork and I won't worry about it too much. No, no, no. It's an, I was already doing too much. And then and I spoke to David and I said, would you be interested? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then before you know it, it's like a, it's this awesome thing. Anyway, it's called Dusk Witch and it's this black and white comic. His artwork is, is kind of the black and white with uh, uh, watercolor undertones, shading and everything. It's really, really cool. Um, he, I found through uh, on my pod podcast while talking to um, Mark Brunel from Lesser Known Comics. Um, so I was chatting with Mark and with David, uh, and then I saw some of David David's artwork and I immediately thought of him. So the etiquette there in my book is I go straight to Mark, who is the primary person who's using this artist, and I say, mm. hey, would you mind if I use da David for this project or if I approach him? Mark says, yeah, that's fine, no worries. Then I go to David and I say... There's no time frame on this. Please don't make sure you push someone else's work out. But when you're able to, if you're interested, da, da, da. that's the right way to do it. Everyone's mm -hmm. polite. And at any any moment, any of them can say, oh, sorry, I'm too busy or I'm whatnot. As long as that's the understanding. And David right. could take as long as he wants. If he wants to take six months to just fit it in, that's fine because I'm not urgent with it. And if I was urgent, I would go to another artist. Um, mm. That's the way to do it. I've seen, though... Um, some posts on social media and stuff with a few uh, guys that do a lot of comics saying, and one in particular saying, please do not come and ask me which artists I use because I know that you're just trying to poach them and that's, that's not on. 
Now, having said that, there is a bit of an onus on the artists themselves. And there are artists out there that'll just say yes to everything. And it's like, well, no, you've got to manage your workflow and be responsible because you don't want to be the one that's taking jobs you can't finish because then you get a reputation. And right. it's the it's this weird thing that no one that comes into comics understands up front because why would you? Um, and it is, this is a business and you're running a business and you have customers and suppliers and contractors. And so you have to run those the way that any business would. And if you don't, you'll lose money, you'll lose reputation, you'll lose customers, you, you know, the whole thing. But like, no one wants to hear that. It's like, but I've got an idea. It's about this sort of Spider-Man character, but it's based on a cockroach and he can see through time with his nose feathers or whatever, you know, some great idea that they, that that's not a great idea, but you know, some or, great or, idea or, or something about someone who's trying to find a fish and accidentally turns into a fish and then they're swimming around. <laughs> there you go. That, for example, for example, <laughs> great idea. Still on the backlog, that one. Um <laughs> Yeah, so you know what I mean. Like no one, it's it's, and it's the same with novelists as well. You, you it, it, and it's hard when you're talking to new new start because I get that. This was another reason why I started the channel going in this direction, was because I kept talking to people. Uh, I mean, I'm talking, you know, indie film directors, uh, writers, um, that are all thinking, I want to get into comics. How do I do it? Mm -hmm. So I'd sit down and have a, a yarn with them for you know a, a couple of hours, and I thought, well, there's enough people that need to know this stuff to you know, start getting right. it out there, but it is a business, unfortunately. Right. So talking about that, do we want, I, I, I want to make sure that we have time to talk about your upcoming Kickstarter, the, the Crimson Folly. Oh yes. The Crimson Folly. <laughs> this has, um, so, so the joke, the joke that I started is this could very well become Morgan's Folly. We'll see. We'll see at the end. <laughs> So the idea was because um, the D and D Dungeons and Dragons style stuff is something I've always loved and been interested in, but I haven't woven a lot of it into my creative stuff. So mm. I thought, here's a perfect opportunity: start a, a novel, uh, not a novel, a comic, but more of an anthology. Get a whole bunch of artists that kind of specialize in that style of D and D art, and right. get them to either do sequential artwork internally or get them to do portraits of the characters. And the whole idea that brings it together is the story takes place within a single fantasy tavern called the Crimson Folly. So it's this localized story, um, and it effectively is about a stolen ring that goes from place to place as they try and uncover what the deal is with it. Um, so you meet all the characters within the, the, the tavern as part of the process, and then the story gets a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, a little bit darker, and then you have an ultimate sort of climax. But that meant, I could work with some of the sequential artists that I know are great that are already, you know, uh, yeah. that I'm already working with new artists that I've never used before. I was able to get uh, some artists that are top tier, amazing quality, fairly expensive, but incredibly good quality because I went to them and said, I need you to do three pages. Could you fit that in instead of, I need okay. you to do 22 or 30 pages and three pages. They can, yep, yeah, I can squeeze that in. No worries. Cause it, you know, had a, a period of months. So right. that's really exciting. The quality is amazing, but also some I've never worked with before. Um, and just they're very different. Some have a, a quite a cutesy kind of style of artwork, like D and D sort of friendly, happy sort of style. Um, right. Others are very gritty and dark. Others are classic comic style. And then I also got to work with a bunch of artists that just do portraits. Um, okay. Which was something I'd not done before. And what I did not realize is this is a great idea for a creative project. It's also a, great idea for a way to throw a lot of money uh down the toilet <laughs> hugely expensive way to do things because if you get one artist doing the lot it's a lot easier to contain your costs but when you've got you know 15 different artists doing everything and then you've got to communicate with them all and then they've all got slightly different lettering and then you you know you've got to also you know the, the artist that's fifth in line in the story doesn't know what the characters look like until they're they're drawn by the previous one because they have to carry it on <laughs> so all of these things that i i've just neglected to realize would be a, an issue um but the actual idea itself i really like i was able to get um uh brian silverback's uh amazing amazing cover artist so he he has done that there's a little snippet of it that you see in that thing it's it's the best cover i've ever had done for a comic book um, and I've had a oh, lot wow. of covers done. So it is so, so, so good. And I was so happy with it. 
um yeah that's that's like a slice of what the total cover looks like it's just it's just amazing um mm. and some of the interior artwork is the best that i've ever seen the story is kind of a playful you know it's not too dark but it's playful it's got some really good sort of characters in there it's got a good range of different characters anyone that's played D would recognize that that world and my genius idea again we will see if this works my genius idea was build a project that brings in all of the comic people that I already know and that know the sort of stuff that I produce and that love comics and bring in the D&D people that might be interested in a comic about D&D related kind of stuff. Right. Genius. And talk to 15 different artists and help the project by getting them to promote on their social media. And so that, so that's how I justified the extra expense by kind of, you know, thinking, well, it's a marketing ploy as well. But we shall see. Again, the lesson I've learned is that you just don't know until the rubber hits the road how it's going to go. Right. And so, um, uh, for the to make sure this is an evergreen podcast, so as of this recording, this hasn't come out in Kickstarter yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but so once, if someone's listening to this a year from now and they say, yeah. "Wow, you know, what? I completely missed the Kickstarter. Uh, where can I find this book? Where would this book be available?" post kickstarter i would say the best avenue for those in the future uh <laughs> with all of the zombies and the invasions and such um is just to come to me so find me uh, either through the youtube channel or morganquade.com send me a message okay. and say hey where's this available because what i don't know yet is uh am i going to send it to a publisher is it going to get picked up and then what format it's going to be and also depending on the success of the campaign there may be an issue too and if there is issue one and two would be available again but i'd say the best best idea is just to come to me straight away and say hey hey friend where's that book thing you did can i please purchase one of those and i'll figure something out because i'll probably have some copies here or i can get them printed in the states and sent through and there'll be a way i can get get it to you and so i guess my 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 other question for you is like because you write so for those that are really interested in checking out Morgan stuff, you can go to may say morganquade.com. You have a very expansive bibliography that's already on here. Uh, question for those that might come to this. They see everything here says 2022. Would they perceivably say you did all of this in a year or is this something when you just actually just actually just put it like publicly out? Yeah. So, uh, uh, I've been writing for years, um, uh, started with novels, then moved into comics probably about seven or eight years ago. No, nine or not. Yeah. Eight or nine years ago. The last, you know, post pandemic, <laughs> I don't know where I am at the moment. Time has just passed. <laughs> um, so a while ago, uh, I had an experience, uh, which is something that, that I'll be talking about on my channel and warn, warn perspective, uh, people about, uh, with my first publisher for a comic book. Um, where I effectively signed a, a dud contract that meant my work was buried. Um, so there is a wow. there is a, a comic that will never appear here or anywhere else um, that is effectively dead because of that contract. But it also um, was was prohibitive in terms of what else I could do. And for, so for a long time, I was producing but not knowing what to do with any of this stuff because I, I felt like, well, is that a risk or not? And then it eventually got to the point I spoke to lawyers and a few other things and I thought, well, no, you know, there's nothing stopping me from moving on. So I'm just going to move on and write that down to a terrible experience. And then off we go around about that time. Um, uh, that was sort of just before the pandemic that that started happening. Um, and there were also other projects that were with other publishers, but they were waiting to come through the pipeline. Um, okay. So they hadn't released yet. So a lot of the Marcosia stuff was just starting to come out and, um, mm. And, at the, and so I just had consequently a bunch of stuff ready to go um, that just happened to coincide with uh, with last year. Um, some of those dates are wrong. Like the, the the Blade in the Dark was supposed to be late last year, but it's sort of you know, been pushed a bit to early this year. So that's coming up next month. Mm-hmm. You know, so a few of them are, are a bit different. Um, but that's why. So that's why it appears. It's also, it's the same with my social media and uh, the YouTube channel and a few. It's like there's nothing... And then all of a sudden I'm everywhere and I'm everything and I'm, you know, because, <laughs> and it's because it was all there. I just couldn't do anything with it for a period of time. And also there, I suffered from that thing that most of us have, which is um, I, at the time, you know, I work a day job, 
uh, I don't want my face and name out there associated with stuff that they might see as being against them or whatever, you know. Mm. Um, not that I'd write anything particularly like, you know, down with the institutions and all that sort of stuff. But, <laughs> you know, there's always that fear. And then there's just that fear of you don't want your face to to get out there. You know, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, it's beautiful, but not everyone yeah. wants to see this. Um, so th there's that barrier that you have to get through as a, as a writer and a creator that's like, okay, I now no longer care. I care more about getting my stuff out there and promoting myself and my work than I mm. do about the shyness of showing myself and talking in public and all that sort of stuff. It's almost like there's a split personality where there's Morgan, the writer and the creator, and you never see him because he's he's up in his little writing nook upstairs, just tapping away, having ideas, thinking cool things, all that sort right. of stuff. Then there's Morgan, the promoter, who is the loudmouthed, boisterous, sort of always on, chatty little man that will sell anything to anyone and, you know, try and garner interest. Um, and that's his job. That's, that's, that's what you're supposed to do. If that helps, you know, to sort of break down right. the two. Because a lot of people do have that resistance and I completely get it. I, I was of the, you know, it's that archaic view of being a writer that, no, no, I just write on my own and make these amazing art pieces and then I give them to a publisher. Everything else is taken care of. It just doesn't work that way anymore. Particularly right. if you're an indie, you, you right. just can't do it that way. And so how how do you decide too is like because you write now as we were talking earlier, you do do comics scripts and and you also do novels how do you make that decision to say you know what this is a better comic than it is a long-form novel how do you make that decision at the moment it's it's more of a practical issue of um uh, how long is it going to take to get this done as a novel versus the shortened time frame of a comic and i can get mm. it out get people reading it because there's nothing stopping me from building it into a novel later on if it proves to be popular. Yeah. Um, so I'm at that stage now where, where I've got so many things on the go that I'm really putting them out there and seeing what really resonates with uh, readers, what really mm -hmm. works, and then tr sort of trying to channel, you know, focus on that. Um, so I'm, I'm always, always writing at least two novels at once. Um, so at the moment I'm writing two and there's a third that I need to get back to, but um Yes, I'm always writing two novels at, work, at, at once and the, the time in the morning that I spend writing, uh, it will start, every day will start with one of those novels and then a little bit in the afternoon I might do or at night if I can't sleep I'll work on the other novel. Um, that's always the priority. And part of the reason is the comics, the initial script, I'll knock that out in a couple of hours, easy, you know, because the word count is so, so small, you know. Um, so the the... Uh, Dusk Witch is a perfect example. Had the idea, thought, okay, what sort of magic system would she use? How would that all work? It's kind of a voodoo New Orleans kind of deal. Great. Okay. Bang. Smash it out. Half an hour. Send it to David. And then uh, he's off sketching out layouts and all that sort of stuff. And I've got only a vague idea of this character because he's going to come back with sketches and then we'll, we'll go back and forward. And But the script is written. So my right. bit is done until the artwork is complete. Then I do lettering and I always change the, the script during the lettering phase once I see the artwork, which is fine. So that's that's like, you know, half a day max. Whereas writing a novel, that's a huge investment of time. You're talking two or three months to write it and then you're talking another month to edit it, send it to other editors, get it proofread. And then, you know, it's all those sorts of things. It's a much bigger investment. So on the novel side, I will go based on motivation. What do I know I'm much more likely to finish hmm. because it's going to be a longer haul and right. I'll get to that middle bit and I'll be, I, I don't want to write this anymore. I'm done. The fun bit is done. We're up to the hard bit now. I don't want to do it. <laughs> but because I have a regular writing rhythm, no matter what, it means even during those periods, let's say I have a month where, so my, a book four of the um, the Seven Hungers, my sort of horror urban fantasy series. Book four was the toughest thing I'd had to write because you, mm. you're four books in, a lot has happened. You have to somehow surprise readers. You have to have twists and turns. But you also, the characters have changed. They've developed everything. And you've got to remember all of the things that have happened and somehow come up with this amazing climax and idea and all that sort of stuff. I really struggled with that. So there's about a month period in the middle of writing. Normally I'll write a novel in, you know, two or three months is the usual time frame. There's a month period where it's just stalled. I wasn't doing anything. 
But even though it stalled, I was still writing every day. It might have been a sentence. It might have been a paragraph. It might have been something. And so a month goes by. You've written 10,000 words, even if you didn't have anything to say. And even if you were struggling with the plot points and everything else, you're still little by little doing enough. And so just by sheer dint of that that process, you end up getting through that period and then something clicks and all of a sudden, you know, you'll be on the toilet or in the shower or something and the idea comes to you and you think, I've got it, rush out in the nutty, you know, that's the nude for anyone that's not from Australia, uh, rush out in the nude, you know, push past family, get to the computer and start tapping away furiously um, or however you do it. And then you've made your way out and then it's just, okay, the next month is just powering through that last thing but i know i've got confidence now i know where i'm heading and lots of stuff that happens all the time right but it's that regular rhythm that just means even if i'm not feeling it doesn't matter time just has to pass and i just have to stick to that thing and i will get through that period right. um yeah it works well it works for me anyway right Cool. I've forgotten the question. There was a question I remember at the start. I, I completely forgot. The, 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 the question was, what was your favorite pizza topping? But you went off right. on the like... <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's not anchovies. Um, that's for sure. No, 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 you you did answer the question. The question was, how do you make the decision based off of, do you make it into a comic script or do you make it in a long form? And you said it was based right. off of, you know, it was more of an, a, a, a question of expediency than it was anything else yeah. so yeah um so yeah. so i'll tell you what so so morgan if people want to learn more and kind of follow your work where's the best place they could they could go to uh there's two places best place to go is just morganquade.com and then you'll find you know, everything out about uh the stuff that i've written and where my stuff can be found um mm -hmm. but you can also find me on social media um the youtube channel is a good place to see a lot of my latest stuff um because i tend to share stuff there as well and I'd say just connect, just, you know, find find me, connect with me, ask any questions if there's something you're interested in. Um, there's still books being released and things that are going to be a little while off, but um, I obviously know right. what they are. So if there's something that interests you, you know, just ask. But yeah, yeah. either the morganquade.com or YouTube at Morgan the Quaid. And uh, yeah, that's probably the best place. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much, Morgan. And listen, you got to come back on and you got, uh, you more stuff coming out and it seems like you're always having things come out but come yeah. back anytime this has been a this has been a great conversation it's been a hoot i appreciate it morgan fantastic thank you so much for for having me and people get out there and support indie creatives all around the world that's right thank you <laughs> good man good man yeah i said i got morgan coming on later today he's like oh you gotta tell morgan i said hi i'm like all right <laughs> we are uh, the the podcast i did with him he um uh one of the questions is if that i ask is you know if you had one childhood toy to pass on to future generations what would it be he, he's the first one that actually went and got his toy and i was uh so encouraged that i went and grabbed mine and we were comparing stuffed animals it was a it was a tender moment. It was quite nice. What was your What was your toy then? It's a little little stuffed gorilla called Ugly. Okay. Um, okay. Just because you know, and, and I have a photo somewhere of me as a baby with this thing next to me, and uh, yeah, I found it a few years ago, and you know, had one of those giddy childhood memory moments. <gasps> ugly, Wait. he's still alive. Yeah, and then, <laughs> uh, as as if the you know the stuffed animals may not be alive anymore, but. Uh, Right. Yeah, it was good fun.